so my name is uh, Calvin Watkins, and uh, I've been with Customer Enterprises for about 10 years. Um, my background is biochemistry. I, I got that uh, degree at uh, Cal Poly San Luis. Um, I'm here to talk about wine preparation. So this is preparing your wine before it goes to bottling. You've already heard bottling and micro uh, um, microanalysis, um, but this is sort of going back to the beginning and talking about preparing your wine for bottling. Wine preparation is the key to the final stages of winemaking to ensure your wine has a good filterability and uh, to reduce the micro load enough so that you can store the wine before it goes to the final filter because if you have a high micro load and you store it for a long period of time, it'll uh, increase into um, something you don't want when you go to your, your bottle. Uh, wine preparation starts with clarification. So uh, um, essentially after all your blending, treatment, stabilization, additions, aging, all that is completed, then you want to go to your primary uh, clarification before the bottle. So essentially, before you go to bottling and before you go to the cartridges at bottling, you should do filtration just before that. Um, don't, you, know, you don't want to add anything or, or, or play with the wine in between those two periods. It should be a smooth transition from one filtration to the next. Um, DE pads, stacks, sheets, cross flow, they're all acceptable ways to do uh, the, your primary clarification. <coughs> Some things to consider uh, when you're doing your uh, primary clarification, you should select the appropriate pour size. So if you go to the bottle and you use a 0.45 at the bottle, um, the 0.45 is an absolute rating, which means the pore sizes in the membrane are exactly 0.45 micron. Um, but when you're doing uh, clarification um, before that, uh, you're usually using a nominal rated filter. So pads and cross flow, these are all nominally rated. That means an average. So if you use a 0.45 pad, it's, it's technically an average. You, you could uh, have particles as high as 0 0.7, 0 0.8 micron that are going through the pad. Um, so um, usually when you, when you uh, select a nominal uh, rated way of clarifying before you go to your final filter, it should, there should be some overlap there. So if you use a 0.45 final, you might want to consider a 0.3 just because of that, that average rating. Um, maintaining proper flow rates and differential Pressures are critical, so when you're using a pad or a, even a DE cake or, or uh, something like that, you don't want to jack it up to five bar just to finish you know, the, the end of your filtration. And it's because you could push things through the, the pad or you could uh, shock the DE cake. Um, especially particles that are soft, um, like uh, bacteria or um, like uh, bentonite. When you, if you, pu you push, if you uh, use enough force, you can, um, they're malleable, which means they can, you know, change shape and, and go through the pore, the small, small pores. So um, if you go too fast or if you go too, if your pressure is too high, you can push stuff through. It's pretty important. And then uh, the primary clarification should be performed as close to the bottling run as possible. You don't want to wait uh, too long. So here's a case study of a cab. Um, they put it through a 0.3 micron pad at two different flow rates. One I'll call the fast flow rate and one the slow flow rate. Um, this is 24 gallon per hour per, per uh, 40 by 40 sheet, 10.5 gallon per hour. And here are some of the results on the right side. Now NTU, some of you are familiar with that. It's a turbidity. It's a measurement of how clear something is. It's a clarity measurement. Uh, at the fast speed, they got a 0.72. At the slow speed, they got a 0.54, and the lower the number, um, the, the more clear it is. And so you look at these, and some people say, okay, this is lower than this, but it's better. But really, 0.72 and 0.54, they're kind of similar. They're, I, I, would, I wouldn't say these two are totally different. Um, with the naked eye, if you look at it, they're both going to look really clear. Um, but there is a big difference in what I call this filterability index. And... Um, I'll show you, uh, I'll give you a demo of the filterability test that we do, but this filterability index is uh, generated by this um, filterability test. At the fast flow rate, they got a 21. At the slow flow rate, they got a 13. And if you look at this chart here, 21, 0 to 12 is easy, which means no loading on the cartridge, very easy to filter. You'll get thousands and thousands of gallons through your, your cartridges. 12 to 25 is acceptable, meaning it's, it's not bad. Um, after a lot of uh, a large amount of wine has gone through, you might see start to see some plugging. And 25 plus is where you don't want to be. That's premature plugging of the filters. Your your filters will plug 
pretty quickly. So even slowing down the speed, they got a significant better filterability index because you know 21 is almost in, in this bad area. 13 is actually really close to easy to filter. So slowing down the, the primary filtration helped at the bottle. You, get, you, you basically get more volume through. Here's a picture of a, a, a membrane filter uh, without any kind of pre-filtration and a membrane filter with pre-filtration. So this, this one, for example, was racked and then just put on the, the membrane. Uh, this is one with, there's been some pre-filtration. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, obvious. You don't, you don't want to block your membranes prematurely and be uh, here. You want to be here. And this is ideal, not having very much particles on the membrane, since the membrane is the, basically, it's the costly part of filtration. It's your final, you know, assurance. So, um, and this is at 40 microns, so you can't even see, you know, some of the smaller things. So I talked about racking. Um, Racking alone is not a suitable means of a primary clarification. Even well-racked wines will have poor filterability and block membranes if there's no primary clarification first. Um, and, and when I talk about membranes, I'm talking about uh, 0 0.45, 0 0.6, you know. There was a question earlier, well, if I rack it and go to a 10 micron um, nominal cartridge, am I okay? Yeah, you probably are, but we're talking about the final filters, the ones that remove microbes. Um, so even well-racked wines will have poor filterability and will block final membranes. Racking does not significantly reduce any micro. So even, um, you've ha even if you've had you know, some settling and you rack over, not all of the micro is going to be settled at the bottom. It's, there's going to be quite a bit, bit still in suspension. If you rack over, you're, you're transferring all that micro over. What the pre-clarification does, it doesn't reduce all of it. That's what the final filter is for, but it reduces a significant, amount, a significant amount of micro so that you can store it for a short period and then filter it with the final filter. Yeah, and racking is variable from operator to operator, so um, it, there's no consistency. Some, some people might do it better than others. Some people will take the wine all the way down to the bare bottom. Some will stop at the top, so there's a little bit of inconsistency. Uh, mixing, and this doesn't mean uh, mixing or recirculating the tank. This means mixing two products together. So after you've already filtered, you don't want to pump over wine from a different tank. And it's because the, the two wines, um, since they, they've been separate uh, for a while and they've um, settled and, and they've become stable in that period of time, if you pump over a wine after it's already been filtered, you could have some interactions that, that form compounds and decrease your filterability. So if you wanted to put like some Cab Franc that you have in this tank and you've already filtered this tank of Cabernet and it's clear and you pump it over, you could have some interactions that could actually uh, decrease your filterability. So really you should, if you top off or mix, um, you should filter again. Storage. Uh, tanks should be stored for a maximum of seven days after clarification before bottling. Um, that's a general rule. After seven days, you, you risk... Um, uh, micro counts being too high. So, um, you know, if you keep, of course, um, if you keep this cool, your tank's cool, you could get a little bit longer, but seven days is really a general rule. The longer a wine is stored, the lower the filterability through the cartridges at bottling, and that's because of the micro counts and uh, because um, other compounds that can form over time. Tanks should be stored cool to prevent microbial growth and the tank temperature should be consistent to avoid filterability changes. So um, if you have a cold spot or a hot spot in your tank, uh, you could actually see filterability changes um, at, in the cartridge, at the cartridge at bottling because uh, due to viscosity. So ideally, you'll have a uniform temperature in your tank. Um, this is the, uh, so this is how bacteria or, or um, yeast grow. They double every so often, so one can, can go to two, four, eight, 16, 32, and that's what's called ex exponential growth. So the more micro you remove with a, a pad or a cross flow or, or a DE cake, the better, because that'll give you a longer storage period before you hit bottling. If you just rack it, you're not reducing the micro load at all. So if you rack it and then wait, um, you, you're gonna get all of this micro on your filters and clog your filters. Um, temperature considerations uh, when you're clarifying. 
So temperature changes cause decreases in filterability, even with stable wines. If you have a stable wine and all of a sudden there's a real hot day, it's 90 degrees outside, especially uh, true in the Central Valley, uh, you could have some instabilities um, even after you've cl clarified it. Same with freezing or, or getting near freezing, you could form some compounds that weren't there before. Um, increased temperature at bottling increases filterability. That's due to viscosity. Uh, so the warm, warmer wines will do better um, at, at bottling than, than colder wines, and that's because um, they, they flow easier. Uh, decreased temperature during storage increases microstability. Uh, so the, the colder the tank, um, the slower the micro growth will be. So really, um, you know, you should consider optimizing your temperature. Maybe take a look at temperature and see how it affects your process. Maybe see if uh, you can make some improvements in storage and at the bottle. Poly, uh, polysaccharides, so this is an interesting topic. Um, Pre-filtered or clean wine can still result in poor filterability. So you've racked it or and then you've clarified it. Um, it's a 0.5 or 0.4 NTU, it's really low, it looks really clear, but all of a sudden it's blo blocking your filters and you don't know why. Um, it could be due to polysaccharides, which are uh, long chain um, molecules. Uh, pectin and beta-glucan are the two notorious ones, and these are present in grapefruit. Um, and uh, I don't mean grapefruit, the fruit, I mean grape flesh. Um, and they're also, it's also very common to see these in people that use a concentrated, uh, grape juice concentrate for color. But um, in many cases, a wine that's already clarified will plug a membrane um, if it contains these polysaccharides. And a quick test uh, to check for polysaccharides, you can actually do it in your lab. I, I don't have it um, here on the slide, but if you want to take notes, it's very simple. You take uh, about 20 milliliters of wine, and you want to add about 40 milliliters of 95% ethanol. And it doesn't have to be food grade. It, can, it could be, um, you know, the stuff with benzene and it doesn't matter. And then you want to add a drop or two of HCl, or hydrochloric acid, or uh, um, sulfuric acid, just some acid to uh, change the pH of the solution. And what you do is stir that up a little bit. And you'll see, if you have pectin in your wine, you'll see these white globules or precipitate fall out of solution. And that's a positive, positive test. Um, and so if you have pectin, uh, the best way to improve filterability is to use a pectinase or a, a beta-glucanase or a, a cocktail of the two. That'll improve your filterability. Could you repeat those numbers again, 20 mils of wine? Yeah, 20 mils of wine, 40 mils of 95% alcohol. So it's one part wine to two parts alcohol. It doesn't matter the volume. So, And then you just add a little bit of acid to change the pH to make it acidic. You can do it in a beaker, and it, and it takes about 10, 15 minutes if to you wait about that long, and then you'll see um, white globules or white precipitate fall out and settle at the bottom of the beaker, and that means you have pectin. Okay, great. Filterability testing. So um, filterability testing gives a rough quantifier for the wine's ability to be easily filtered. So this is what I'm going to demo here. Um, Many versions of filterability tests are used in the industry. You probably use some in your lab now, um, but most use this uh, small membrane disc, disc to filter uh, to measure filter blockage over time. There's pictures of the, the Swinex filters here. They're little um, housings that hold membrane filters. Some of the tests are also called Bolton tests, but um, usually they're all on the principle of flow decay, where if you measure a certain volume wine. Um, will go through a, a membrane at a certain pressure. You can measure how long that takes, and then an equal volume of wine after that um, should, in theory, be, take the exact amount of time as the first half. That means that there's no flow decay and that's a perfect, um, that's an ideal uh, filterability. But in many cases, you'll see that the second <coughs> volume through the same filter will take a lot longer than the first volume did. And that's, that's what's called a flow decay test and, and uh, the filterability test is based on that. Here's our procedure. So we saw this earlier in the slide talking about filterability index or clogging index. Um, our procedure is you take 500 mils of wine, uh, you um, add it to this vessel here. There's a 25 millimeter Swinex at the bottom, uh, and then you, you, you put a, a membrane in the holder, um, pressurized to two bar, and you record the time in minutes to pass the first 200 mils and record the time in minutes to pass the whole thing. And then you really uh, multiply the, 
the first half by two, subtract it from the total time, and then multiply that by 100. And you get these numbers here. So again, zero to 12 is easy. 12 to 25 is acceptable. And acceptable means it's, it's okay, but you could probably optimize it. Um, and then 25 or higher means heavily loaded. That's the same index I was on the first. That's how you get the index you had. Right, right, right. So you use this calculation here. I don't know if it's in the catalog. Um, it could be on our website, but if I, I can send you this, um, if you email me, I can give you my card and, and we'll, I'll get it to you. So I'll demo how this works. <laughs> so pointing to this vessel here, there's actually a, a, a metal mesh screen at the bottom that traps any really large particles. The opening is very big. This is the Swinix uh, holder here, and that contains the, the membrane that I'm using. Close up the vessel. I have a stopwatch here, and so I'll, I'll turn on the air like so. So I have 200 and 400 marked. Um, I have a two bar pressure in this um, nitrogen tank. You don't have to use nitrogen. You can use air as long as it's clean air. It has to be scrubbed so that no oil or particles um, stick to the, the filter. Um, of course, um, when you do this test, you want to use the filter that you use in the facility and the pore size that you use in the facility. I'm using the Millipore uh, 0.45. So this is similar to Vitapore. If you've heard of Vitapore before, this is the exact same filter. So this is 45 seconds at 200. And really, this test is optimized for um, the final filter, the absolute filter. If you use something like a Beviguard or a, a nominal filter, and, which is the average pore size one, um, you can get a general idea using this test. But really, this, this test is for um, the absolute, the, the final filter at the bottle. This is a two bar, it's a two bar. 29 PSI, yeah. There is another uh, test you, um, you can do um, using a, like a pad filter um, if you wanted to check um, nominal ratings, but it's, it's, you would use a different setup. You wouldn't use this one. You would use a, um, something with a positive flow pump and a, and a pressure gauge. So ideally, you know, the second half should have took as long as the first half, but if, as, you, as you can see, it's slowing down quite a bit here near the end. And here's my mark here. So as I'm at 108 seconds on this, uh, for total time. So going back to this calculation, if I did 108 seconds total and, and I divide that by 60 to get time in minutes, that's 1.8. And if I had 45 seconds for my first 200 and I multiplied that by 2, that's 90. And then if I divide 90 by 60, I get 1.5 minutes. So if I take 1.8 and subtract 1.5, I get 0.3. Multiply that by 100 and I'm at 30. So if I had 5,000 gallons of this particular product uh, and I was trying to go through a membrane, I would, have, I would think that this wine would plug a, um, 
a 0.45 uh, vitipore membrane. Um, you know, at the time, this wine was probably clear when it was, uh, when they filtered it, it was probably, you know, a little bit easier to filter, but in the box over, you know, I don't know, a few weeks, the, uh, your filterability can change. So uh, some more particulars on filterability testing. Uh, larger diameter membranes give a more accurate test. So some tests out there use a 13 uh, millimeter membrane, which is pretty small. Um, and it doesn't really give you a full picture because you use su such a less volume. You use, sometimes you use about 100 mils through these little small filters. Um, I recommend a 25 millimeter. A lot of people use 47, which is good. Um, you just have to make sure that you use uh, enough wine to get the full picture through a 47, something like a, a two liters or so. Um, you need enough volume to cause some plugging of the membrane because if you're not plugging it at all, if there's no flow decay at all, um, you have to think to yourself, well, when is there going to be a, a flow decay? When is it going to plug? Um, also, 13 millimeters are susceptible to, to air bubbles or um, uh, particles causing a false result. So since you use such little volume, um, even the smallest particle on that small uh, surface area can cause um, a bad result. Small changes in the way you do the test can have a big impact, so make sure your filter size is consistent, make sure your air supply is consistent, that you don't have any um, sputtering or stop and start on your air supply, and make sure you record your time accurately. Uh, even a second or two can change your filterability index. Uh, membranes are the best choice for determining the filterability, since the lot-to-lot -lot performance is pretty consistent. Um, so if I were to do the, the test again, I should be getting consistency. So today I got 32, 32, and 30 on the index. It was pretty consistent. Filterability testing provides one data point for one time period. So it's like a, a snapshot of the tank at that time. Um, uh, so, you know, it's important where you sample. Um, if you sample at the top or at the bottom, it's probably not representative of your entire filtration run. So uh, partway up the tank is probably best. At the bottom, you have a lot of sediment that sits down there and the wine is dirtier at the bottom. Also at the top, you could have uh, either, um, you know, wine that's too clean, that's not representative of the whole tank, or wine that where uh, there's been some oxidation that could cause some compounds. Um, so the best place to settle is right in the middle. That's going to be the bulk of the um, product, and that's going to be a representative sample. Uses for the filterability number. Um, the results help you identify hard-to-filter wines. Um, whether you need an additional clarification stage, whether you need to re-clarify the tank, or if you have polysaccharides, it, it can help you identify these things. And it can help you gauge your process improvements. Um, so whether you need to add a cross flow maybe to help um, improve that filterability number, whether you need to implement storage or temperature rules to, to improve that number. So don't just test for the sake of testing. Um, if you test and you get a number and you say, I got a 20, that's acceptable. You know, think about how I can pr pr improve my filterability through the membrane. How, how can I get it to a 10 or an 8 or a 6 by um, adding some of these rules or some of these uh, process improvements? So with that, I'll hand it to Jim, and he'll talk about um, beverage hoses. Thank you, Calvin. Good afternoon. <coughs> So we are going to talk about hoses. I'm Jim Lunt. I'm going to introduce in a minute Peter Tiedemann. Peter is the product manager for Contatech North America. They make the Blotic wine hose, in addition to a bunch of other hoses, especially hoses for breweries, etc. But we recommend the Blotic uh, for wineries. Gussamer <coughs> um, sells this hose that uh, Contatech makes, so that's why we're here. Peter's a product manager for Conatech. He's been there eight years, and he's been in the industry for 23. I'm a product manager for Gussamer. I've been with Gussamer two years, and I've been in the industry 40 years. So the question that you probably have in your mind today is, if he's been in the industry 40 years, how does he look so young? <laughs> um, perhaps that's not the question. Maybe the question is, why are we going to bother with hoses? Yeah, that's a better question. So, uh, hoses, of course, are an important part of what goes on in a winery because they're what you use to transfer wine from location to location, tank to tank. You may have seen in some of the other, se other sessions discussion about BevTrack, 
Above track uh, here nearby in Windsor is a company that actually goes into wineries, helps folks like you and me if they've got bio problems or they've got spoiling problems or they've got something they can't figure out. And they probably do a lot of things, but one of the primary things they do is swap surfaces, swap fittings, swap tanks, swap equipment, do cultures, figure out what is in what location, what microbial life is in what location. In the process of doing this for a number of years in the West Coast, they've got a pretty good sized database of what seems to always be recurring about the same in these different wineries. They've given us permission to publish some of this. So here we have a slide for yeast bacteria and mold hanging out in bottling equipment. This is the sum of what they've gathered in their culture. Surprising screw caps, number one. Uh, I wouldn't have thought that, but perhaps nobody else thought that either. And maybe what they've done is not clean that equipment because it's stainless steel. But the thing that I find even more surprising is the lines that come into the filling equipment are number two for bacterial load. Then the next summary is zygo. That's my favorite organism because it lurks around, you can't see it, you grow slowly so you're not really sure you have it. If it ends up in your wine, you end up with a spoiled wine or a re-fermented wine and your customer gets to enjoy that hazy wine. So, any of you have ever have zygo experiences? Uh, some of the folks in some of the other uh, groups have. I've actually been involved in a product recall. It's not fun. And where is it hanging out? Well, it's hanging out in cooperage. Not a surprise. Oak is porous, hard to clean. You can see that it would be there. But the big surprise to me is the second place it's hanging out is in hoses. If we're using those hoses to go to bottling, we probably want to be able to do something about that if that's the location for that microbial life. So that's why we're talking about hoses today. That's the reason. So now I'm going to bring this to Peter. He's going to talk to us about engineered hoses. Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> I'm here to talk a little bit about, about hoses and how they're constructed, how they're built, and uh, what is the, yeah, the hazard point in the winery for the hoses. Conditec produces a lot of different hoses for a lot of different industry. In the food and beverage industry, uh, we are pretty much everywhere present with our hoses, a different selection of hoses for each industry, and uh, us as well in the wine industry. We have, uh, as Jim mentioned, the Blaudic hose, which is also what you have on the table uh, for the wineries. And then we have uh, like purple snake, it's a different type of hose, it's used for the brewing industry and also in the distilleries and uh, some of the other hoses are used in the cosmetic and pharmaceutical industry. The uh, question is what does uh, a hose has to withstand and what are the general requirements for the hose and here you see like there's some is from the outside, some is from the inside, and uh, the cover of the hose has to be a resistance against abrasion. So if you slide it over the floor, if you maybe even drive over the hose, it should withstand and survive this kind of stuff. Uh, as well as this, uh, or has to be resistant against uh, weather, UV, ozone, all this is uh, usually pretty tough on the hose, and as well, acid, chemicals, fat, oil, whatever is possible, get in touch with, with, a, with a hose. And outside pressure, but this uh, should be, in your case, no problem. Uh, from the inside, there you have the pressure as well. And there is the pressure given from the system you're working with and from the pumps. And if you have uh, pumps, then you also yeah, sucking, that means the hose should withstand also the sucking pressure. The hose overall should be very smooth so that nothing sticks to the, to the inner liner and uh, that's why we have like a little sample on the, on the table that you feel like it is very smooth so that nothing could stick or stuck to it. 
And uh, of course, it has to be resistance against chemicals. If you clean it, especially cleaning is, is a critical point here, that you have detergents, disinfectants, which could affect the inner lining. The hose should be uh, reasonable light in weight and, of course, flexible. That's why you use it. The selection criteria, criteria for the hoses is, in the first place, of course, the ID, so that you can work and get enough materials through the hose line that it is sufficient for your operation. The hose length, how much you need, and uh, the, the tolerance of the, of the hose of the size. The temperature, on the one end from the material <coughs> conveyed in for the wine, it is not so much that it's extreme temperature, but if you go with the detergents or with the cleaning, then you use a lot higher temperature, and this are, um, could affect the hose and the <coughs> lifetime of the hose. Here it is interesting to know what is the maximum temperature and uh, if it's continuous or peaks, the timing is also a question. <coughs> Applications, and yeah, overall it has to be, or we should know if it should be oil, oil resistance, conductive or not, and uh, everything around the hose is usually important for the selection of the specific hose. The material conveyed could be everything. Here it is wine, but also if you have cleaning substance, substances, then it is a question what is going through the hose and if, it, if the hose lining is resistant against this. The pressure is the working pressure of your system or of your operation. And uh, the hoses are usually, these hoses have a safety factor of four, so it's, this one is designed for 10 bar, 145 PSI, and so it's uh, currently 40 bars uh, for the burst pressure, above 40 bars. And very important part or piece of the whole hose or the hose line is the fitting. On the one end is the type size, because the fitting is actually responsible, or it's yeah, attached to the host, and both of them have to match very well to each other. And because it, this could be a hazard point for the for your operation. As those two samples go around <coughs> together, take a look at them. They're a set, and you can see a difference in them. Yeah, they are marked. They are one is too strong, one is too loose. And if you see the stronger one when you touch inside you feel like there's a bubble and this could be a potential hazard point. There could be yeah, sticking and, and living some bacteria you don't want to have in your system. Yeah, the right size of the fitting and the male or female, this is important to know that we have a chance to provide the right <coughs> hose lining. What could happen if you not <coughs> consider the right hose or if you use the wrong hose for your oper operation or for your material that you convey, then the first is contamination of your wine so that it is damaged or damaged the wine. And uh, of course, if it's also related to the, to the life of the hose, the lifespan, and uh, it could shorten, so <coughs> extremely shorten the, the lifetime of the hose. This hoses, for example, they, they are good for at least eight, 10 years if you use such, such a hose. For example, you saw the brewing hose. They are in use in breweries for yeah, eight, 10, sometimes even longer. And they are cleaned every day. They are under really tough conditions. And so this hose lasts really long if you take care of it. Um, yeah, the degradation of the hose <coughs> That could, yeah, that makes sense, or, or it is, uh, could cause leakage of the, of the hose line. And uh, bursting, if you not have a proper hose, you could have a bursting hose line, or, <clears throat> which could affect the people around and could actually harm people. Electrostatic discharge is also important in a certain area, depends on what you're working with, and uh, all of the hoses are conductive, 
from the hose outside. The hose cover is conductive. So now I would like to talk a little bit how the hose is constructed, so to see how it's built actually. These hoses are extruded on a, met, uh, on a steel mandrel. It's a continuous process. And uh, here is an example with an UPE liner. UPE is an ultra high molecule weight polyethylene. It's a special lining for chemicals. It's a very, very good <coughs> chemical resistance with this material. And the next layer is an intermediate layer um, to protect the inner lining from the reinforcement layer, also to get a better adhesion between the reinforcement layer and the UPE lining. The next one is again an intermediate layer, and here in this example it is a helix, which could be steel or polyamide, depends uh, on the uh, application. And then you have another reinforcement layer. You can build um, as you like the hose. It's according to the application. Here this one has, for example, four layers of uh, fabric. This is the polyamide fabric layer reinforcement. And on top of <coughs> all of this comes the layer, the cover layer, and then the hose is finished. The inner lining, the lining of the hose, the most important stuff, it has to be according to the FDA regulation. It has to be certified so that it is safe to use in the food and beverage industry. It has to be very smooth and non-porous so that really nothing could stick to this layer and cause any problem or creating a hazard point in your operation. And very uh, important of, as well is that it's not affecting the product you convey through it, that there's no change in odor or, or in uh, the taste of the product. The lining should be extruded, as mentioned before. We only do extrusion or extruding the hose <coughs> from the bottom to the top. And, uh, but there are different systems around. There are wrapped linings, which are like laying next to each other. And uh, there could be a possibility that they crack or that they're open. And uh, the medium would go inside the hose and uh, could uh, contaminate the product. Very important, of course, because you have to clean the hose, is uh, resistance to detergent and disinfectant. And uh, another thing is very important, the mechanical cleaning, that this is resistant to clean with, uh, with a pick, which is like a little ball, a sp <coughs> sponge ball, which is pretty much scrubbing the inside of the hose and taking really everything out of the hose so that it is perfectly clean that you don't have anything stuck in there. Because if you go only with the water through the hose, then you have the problem that you only rinse it, but you're not taking anything what sticks to the liner really with it. So it's, you do something, but it's actually not really clean at the end. And there's a bacteria and everything growing in this kind of uh, uh, lining. According or with the disinfectant and detergents, uh, it's important that they are resistant or the inner layer <coughs> of the hose is resistant. So that's why we have also a list which a lot of different uh, disinfectants and detergents so that we can check that everything is good to go through the hose. The Choice of the right lining material, as mentioned before, <coughs> depends on, on what you put through. And if it's fatty oily foods, or in your case, it's an alcoholic <coughs> product, or fruit acid, it depends on what type of inner liner you have in the, in the hose. For potable water, you have a certified hose, which is a special inner liner. It's over there, it's actually also an UPE liner which is certified and registered that you can use it for portable water. There's a lot of different compounds you can use for hoses. So in the food and beverage industry, we have like four major compounds we use. <coughs> That's uh, the one on the top uh, in red, 
That's the first one is the NR is a natural rubber. Then the second is the NVR is a nitrobutyl butyl rubber. And uh, at the end is the chlorobutyl and uh, the EPDM is the ethylene propylene diene monomer. That's are commonly used uh, compounds for the host in the food and beverage industry and they have different characteristics and depending on the application you choose either one for the inner liner or for the cover depending what you want to achieve. These hoses are <coughs> uh, working or very good for the cleaning in place procedure. It is uh, a perfect system to clean the hose and the whole system of course. In regards to reinforcement, <coughs> they are, um, there's a need for them to be hydrolysis stable so that there's no diffusion or no deterioration of the reinforcement from that the hose from the inside out is destroyed. The <coughs> reinforcement and also the hose itself has to be uh, able to be steamed and uh, there you go with temperature up to 266 Fahrenheit and uh, there's a maximum time or, or time limit for this uh, temperature for 30 minutes. If you overdo it, if you think like, okay, a lot more is better, but then you actually damage the hose. You will see pictures of uh, later of damaged hoses where people overdid it and uh, not always more is better. Here you have to be careful, especially when the temperature is that high. The reinforcement are re responsible for the vacuum stability, as mentioned before. And here you could use, or responsible for that is the, the textile layer. Here with the four layers, this is a very stable and solid hose. So you achieve here also vacuum stability with this. But um, if you get <coughs> higher suction, then you would go with a helix, either way, steel or polyamide. And uh, for the reinforcement layer, it is important for the fabric that the angle you put on this, on the reinforcement is uh, at this 54.7, so that it is not changing or the hose is not changing uh, over that it's lengthening or fattening when you put pressure on this hose. For the hose cover, the most important part is uh, abrasion resistance and the weather or UV and ozone resistance because you don't want to have cracks on the outside of the hose, which happens very often if you have the hose laying around and then you see like it's cracking on the outside and that's a sign that you actually should replace the hose. Uh, as well, resistant to oil and fat, I don't think so in your case that's, that you have this around your hoses. And uh, important for the hose cover is that you have to, to mark, I think this one is not showing anything, but over there on this one, for example, there you have the, the, <coughs> the signs, the FDA approval, and uh, all the information of the hose should be on this that it is safe to use in the food and beverage industry. As mentioned, it, this hose and all the other hose we use are in the food and beverage industry. They are all approved according to and certified according to FDA regulations so that it is safe to use. And as mentioned, they have to be, everything has to be mentioned on the hose. When you see that you know, over there, that's important that this is on the hose. If not, you should not use it in your operation if you don't have it on the hose. Here, I would like to show, as mentioned before, for the hose line itself, it's very important that you have the fitting, fitting really well with the hose. There, of course, both of them have to work together and the lining on the one hand but also with the coupling, there should be one, one smooth transfer so that nothing stuck and nothing is building up in between. Here, <clears throat> this is two examples where actually these are bad ones because here on, where's my pointer? Here you see it's not evenly closed. 
So that means the pressure of this is, is not right from, and it's not sealing correctly the hose <coughs> and uh, would cause leakage. And here, this one is actually the other extreme. It's way too strong crimped together, uh, screwed together. And uh, this will also cause that the hose is leaking. This should not be used. Here we see an example of what could happen to a hose when you have them with a the wrong fitting. And there you see the bad thing. You have here a lot of stuff stuck in, stuck in, uh, in the hose and creating really a point of hazard for your operation. Because you have your wine going through this area and taking nicely all this stuff with it. You see the notches on the outside of the hose? Not the inside piece, but you see the notches on the outside? Those are bandits. You know, it's very common to use banded bands to clamp uh, a hose barb into a hose. And they hold really well. You know, they originally were designed to not allow the fitting to slide out. But what they don't do is close that <coughs> crack between where the end of the fitting occurred and the bandit is. So you get a gap there that is potential to fill up with bacteria or microbial life and you can't clean it because it's a dead end crack. There's no way to wipe it out or soap it out. And so it's there after you've sanitized the hose. The next time you use the hose, it's basically a bacterial uh, hotel to make a donor as you're coming and going with wine across that spot. When you have these steel ferrules, this collar, it's called a ferrule, it's actually longer than the barb that goes into the hose. It's hydraulically crimped. They actually smash that down and capture the rubber hose down onto that barb. So because it's longer, there's none of this gap <clears throat> where the hose is allowed to spread away from the fitting. It actually holds the hose in contact with that steel fitting. And that's why I pointed out that you want to look at these two hoses. One of them is over cramped and it actually has pooped the hose up so that there's a kind of a ridge there that's not smooth. The other one isn't crimped tight enough, so you get this effect. You have a space where it doesn't, hasn't pulled that rubber down. The hose shop actually inspects those and hydraulically tests all the hoses. Those, that's where they come from. They realize there's a problem, they cut it off and cure it. So what you want is that smooth transition that you see in that smaller hose. It just goes perfectly from the stainless steel right onto the rubber. It's all crimped and married together with that uh, connection so that you don't have this problem that you have with bending. This was the explanation for all this. <laughs> and so, yeah, you heard that it is very important that the, the fitting is, or the coupling is fitting perfectly to the hose and that the, the lining is really smooth and the transition from the coupling to the hose is perfect. If not, it's creating a, a, a dangerous point or a hazard point for your operation. Here you see this would be not acceptable. This should be replaced and this should not be used. As well, important is also that the, the hose line is also in a relaxed <coughs> position. It should not be bent extremely, so then you have too much stress on the coupling and you create over there also <coughs> a possibility for failure and leakage as well as, uh, um, yeah, bacteria nesting over there. Here is another example of a perfect place, how it should look like. As mentioned before, if you try to clean and say like, okay, more is better, then you could create this one here. There in the inside, you see, there's a hose, it's completely damaged, the hose lining, and uh, the operator confirmed here that he overdid it. He wanted to have it extra clean, but actually what he created was he damaged the hose. So if you go too long, too high temperature, too long, either way, both is not good. So you should stay within the, the limits for the hose. And this, this hose, as mentioned before, is like 266 Fahrenheit maximum temperature, and 30 minutes is the 
the range of time you should not uh, exceed. Here, this is another picture. You don't want to have this kind of stuff in your place. This should be replaced and uh, exchanged. The Blaudik hose could be used uh, <clears throat> in the bottling room, in the tank to filter, filter to filter, or in the truck loading. But uh, also important is if you have, use FlexiFill for overseas or a FlexiFill overseas container, if you do that, you want to have the minimum yeah, influence or contamin contamination of your wine. And therefore, it's very important that you have a hose line which is not having any kind of bacteria in there. So therefore, it is very important to use the right hose line or a good quality product so that your high quality wine is not somehow affected and your customers spoiled or, or get like a bad bad quality wine. And that's it for today. Thank you very much. And any questions for me or for Calvin? Or for Tom, uh, Jim, of course. <laughs> Uh, thanks for coming. pricing on this on the hose and yes, yeah, we do. Yeah. Okay. Talk to your salespeople or give us a call just okay. Okay. Can you break the hand on I don't think so. The hose shop is back east. Uh, yeah. so those that have to be shipped to them and they're coming out new. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, you have to use certain certain companies who are qualified for that. Because they have to pressure test the hose and to certify that it is 100% correct and they label it. So when the hose gets out to use that, you ensure that you have a high quality product and that it's correct. Also, the ferrule is sized to be able to be crimped to a thickness of the wall versus the size of the bar. So it's kind of an engineered system. If you get a hose that you don't know, it's harder. How do you keep this looking like that so you can use it? Was a guy dragging around this all the time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, does he, report, does he report to you? Can you motivate him? <clears throat> no, but there are protection rings. Yeah. You put on this area, and so that's a rubber ring actually, and so then you not damage the the um, the coupling or the fitting. And outside there's a, a little brochure, and there you see them. They're the showing the the protection ring. I've known folks that have actually taken a, a mating fitting and put out blanks and the cell men are required to screw a mating fitting on there before they move the hose, just so they don't tear off the, tear off the thread. Same thing with, uh, even with the tri-clamp, you know, you can beat a tri-clamp where it won't work either. So. Yeah, you see, they are some kind of protection rings, so. Rubber donuts. Yeah. yeah. So, and they are also at the, at, at the coupling itself. But if you see outside the catalog, there's the picture exactly. Generally speaking, on cleaning of hoses, and we weren't here to really talk about CIP, but generally speaking, whether it's our hose or somebody else's hose, be sure that you're cleaning with over 10 linear feet per second flow. Uh, think of the water running down a stream. You know, all the water's running really fast down the center of the stream, but on the bank, you know, it's just kind of wandering along. It's the same with any hydraulic system, same in air ducts and it's the same inside of a wine hose. That water is really flowing through the center, but it's just walking down the wall. So what happens is, it doesn't really get a scrub. You know, it just is just meandering along. If you get to a high enough flow, you pass what's known as a certain Reynolds number, named after the guy that did the hydraulic studies. All of a sudden, that flow is so fast, it actually tears that static fluid off the wall. And when it tears it off, you get a turbulence. So you'll get a scrubbing. Now, <clears throat> how do you know 10 linear feet? Well, you might have to figure out how much your pump pumps by getting a tub, laying out a hose line, timing how fast it takes it down, and figuring out, calculate with a tape measure, what, how many gallons is it. And you can find in any engineering manual or on the internet, a gallon is 231 cubic inches. Figure that out against the size of the hose. If you've got a one horsepower pump, and a four inch hose, that flow is going to be different than if you've got a 20 horsepower pump and a half inch hose, right? I mean, you just got to figure out what's happening to that flow. And 
you basically want to make sure that water is shredding on the wall so it's turbulating on the wall and it's scrubbing. That's why pigs or sponge balls are so good because regardless of the flow, <clears throat> you lay out a hose line to sanitize, get a tub of water circulating, get all the air out of the system, get your soap in, stop, drop a hose, put a sponge ball in and hook it back up. What's that sponge doing? It's wiping the wall of the hose. It won't go through valves, but you know, again, it's trying to clean it. For your FDA approved hoses, what's, um, do you have any type of ISO certification for where this is manufactured, like food safety? I know a lot of yeah, this, this whole stuff produces actually in Germany and uh, they are produced according to ISO standard and uh, I can give you more information if you would like so. Yeah, just let us know, we'll give you ISO certificate. Okay, I'm just curious if it was 22,000 or 9,001, what? Um... I don't know without seeing the certificate, but we can look it up for you. Yeah, I will find out. Okay. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.